I'd like to start with a complaint. <laughs> Are we okay sound-wise? Okay. All the times I've been to Sierra Leone, I never got a day on the beach. <laughs> it's just not fair. Actually, the first time I went, I was almost on the beach because with the Civil War and all that was happening, there was nowhere really to stay. But they found a place called Dr. Bengi's Guest House. <laughs> it was almost on the beach. In fact, it was so close to the beach that the bed was a slab of concrete with a layer of sand on the top. And uh, Richard... Cole said, do not eat anything here. <laughs> you will die. <laughs> All right. Hmm. Who went to the grave? Jesus, yes. This is, a, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask a question, and it's not difficult because the answer each time is going to be, Jesus. <laughs> or, Jesus! Oh, whoops, that woke somebody up. Who went to the grave? Jesus. Whew. You can't do that sitting down. You're going to have to stand up. Come on, stand up. You're going to have to kind of move your arm into the air like Jamie or, well, one or two, I don't mind. Just, it's more of a, yeah, all right. I know what I've got in my mind. Who rose again? Jesus. Who lives forever? Jesus. Who's the King of Kings? Who is the one that comes when we call? Jesus. Why? Because he's always there. Who loves me with an everlasting love? Jesus. Who will never leave me nor forsake me? Jesus. Yeah, we're getting the hang of it now. <laughs> All right. Do, do have a seat. <clears throat> I want to talk about battle cry. What do you think the word might be? Gee. Thank you, Margaret. They're just a little bit louder than they could all follow you. Our battle cry is not a system. It's not an organization. It's not something that we kind of <clears throat> drum up. It's the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus... Every knee shall bow. Yeah. That's our battle cry. Battle cry is a, is a call to action. And we believe that God is calling us to action in this next stage. Does that sound good, bad, or indifferent? Hands up for good. Three. Hands up for bad. Hands up for indifferent. Hands up for healing for paralysis of the arms. <laughs> right. God's calling us to action now. Yeah? Um, he's been preparing us with fresh sight of him. He's been leading us to lay down our lives for one another. Two of the primary things, to see him afresh, to catch that fresh anointing, and the outworking of that, according to what the Word of God says, is we love one another and we lay down our lives for one another. Absolutely key, wonderful, and total turnaround from being self, first, last, and always. Problem is, it comes with a bit of a question. Are you willing to
to respond to the battle cry. To pick up that there's something that's a stirring. There's something that God has prepared for us for such a time as this. If you want to use the, the old sort of war analogy, to come out of the trenches to face the enemy. It's a something about it, without getting stuck on the kind of modern warfare or anything like that, it's about making a move, about a commitment to action, to follow God. And I just want to mention a couple of things. <clears throat> Fighting spirit. You see, the Bible is not just stories of long ago. It's basically what God has given us as a major way in which he speaks to us today. And therefore, we don't hesitate to, to refer back and see what is it that God is saying to us through this familiar story or for this verse that we've never really seen. Clearly, God had put a fighting spirit in David. And clearly he faced lots of discouragement. This is a favourite tool of the enemy. His father, his brother, the king and the enemy all underestimated him. He's just the youngest. He stays at back and looks after the sheep. Father, brother, king and enemy. Remember how the enemy mocked that this, this boy would come against the armies. But he did have a fighting spirit and it had been put into practice against the bear and the lion. Of course, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. I have never yet walked down Green Lane and encountered a bear. I did come closer to a lion than I was comfortable with. We were in one of these safari things in, um, oh, I can't think of the name anyway, it's in Africa, it's a big country. What was the name of that? I don't know. Which one? No, no, it was in South Africa. Anyway, not to worry. And we were having this amazing, amazing thing to drive you around on like a Land Rover. And uh, um, they stop at certain points where they think it might be interesting. Well, they stopped at this point where this lion was a asleep, probably, and it was like he was asleep on my side of the Land Rover. No doors, very open. Probably as close as Henry is to me right now. And he turns off the engine. And we sit there looking at this line. I thought, hmm, what if that engine doesn't start first time? <laughs> Who's first in line? Yeah. After about five seconds, I'd seen enough of that line. I would like to get out of here, you know. Not quite the fighting spirit that, that David had. 1 Samuel 17 tells us, David <clears throat> goes and speaks to Saul. He says, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it. I mean, this takes a bit to really get into your mind. I went after it, a lion or a bear, struck it, rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Anybody fancy that job? <laughs> that seems pretty determined. A very real fighting spirit. Do you have that determination not to give up? Oh, well, it's only one sheep. You know, I'm worth more than the sheep. And uh, let's move out of here quick. No. If God has said, I want us to be a people that are not willing to say, oh well, 
never mind, another day. When God speaks, that's our opportunity to go and to move. So, have to have a fighting spirit. You need to be responsive. Responsive to what God is saying. These are things which we're saying, this is part of getting ready, part of responding to that sense of God's moment, God's time, God's season for us as a community. I like the response. It's very rapid. He doesn't sort of dwell on it. The Bible says that he gets up early in the morning. Okay, I basically because he was being the errand boy. He was taking supplies to the, to the front or to where the army was for his brothers. That was about what he, you know, well, he can do this. He can be the errand boy. Gets up early to take supplies to the brothers. See, it doesn't really matter what the particular task or role is. What matters is our heart and attitude before God and our commitment to go his way and do what he says. I like the idea that he gets up early. It must have been early because he then got to the battlefield at the same time as the army was coming out. So he didn't waste time. You want, when we hear God, it's good to, to just get on with it. Uh, otherwise, the birds of the air, the Bible talks about, can snatch away that seed. Once you've heard it, you get on and do it. You settle in your heart if God speaks. Basically, yes or no is decided pretty much there and then. I mean, God is very good. He confirms his word. But there's something inside that you just know. And it's best once the decision is made to proceed. Now, it may be you're, you know, a youngster. Maybe you're... You know, not eat hardly in teens, and God says, I want you to, to go and reach people in... What's a good place to go? Sierra Leone. <laughs> uh, well, you might not go right then, but in your heart you've decided it's settled. You know? But that's kind of rather dramatic. God speaks, we decide to say yes once you've heard it or otherwise you say no. So focus not, if I obey, but how best to act in obedience. The decision's made, now what is the best action to pursue? Maybe it's not something quite so dramatic as that. Speak to that man in the bus queue, or that man waiting for the train. See, if you wait too long to, to process through that, basically, the great danger is the birds of the air snatch away the seed. The best response is, yes, Lord. Once a decision is made, it's settled. Yes, God in his faithfulness will give confirming words and directions. If you wait too long kind of deliberating around it, if you will obey or not, then the danger again is it will be stolen. Something that the enemy sends, and the Bible uses this, uh, this illustration of the birds of the air taking the seeds, but it can be many things like that. Interestingly, I, I like this verse in Isaiah 30. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. That's always intrigued me. If the voice is behind me, that means I'm already on the way. That as I go, as I step forth, and as I say yes or even no, basically, God wants us to do his will even more than we might ever want. And he enables that. And the, the first step of moving out, yes, often leads to another voice or the voice of God coming a second time. 
This is the way. This is it. It's like the confirmation sometimes follows more strongly after we have made that initial response. Our conf confidence in, is in God's ability. <clears throat> Whether you turn to the right or the left, your ears will hear a voice directing. We heard of the prompts when Nick was talking to Dorena. How God even spoke in a dream. Any of you ever heard God in a dream? I can't see. Oh, a number of people. Okay. Mm. Yeah. So what was David's motivator or motivation? It was God's glory and fame. It wasn't about David's promotion. It was all the things that would be given to somebody who killed the giant. That wasn't what he was after. It was God's glory and fame. In fact, he even turned down the offer to marry Saul's first daughter. What was it he said? I love these words. That the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Yeah? yeah? Anybody give me an amen yes to that? Yeah, yeah. I, I'm not frightened when you speak to me. I love it. Yeah? That the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Yeah, amen. amen. That's what we're about. That's what he gives to us. That's the, the joy of serving him. But it does make you think, what is, the, what is the prize that you're seeking? What is the prize I'm seeking? If it deviates away from that the whole world might know that there's a God. If it deviates away from that God might be glorified, we're slightly on a, more than a dodgy ground. We're probably moving with an inaccurate motivation. Then he was confident in God's ability. So we need the fighting, fighting spirit. We need to be responsive. We need the clear motivation. And then our confidence is in God's ability, not in mine. He wouldn't pretend to be someone else. He wouldn't put on Saul's armour. He was David, the shepherd boy. Strong confidence is based not on the weapons, or the reward, but on a commitment to God to do what God says, what he wants. No one felt equipped to take on the challenge of Goliath. The whole army was, was stymied, basically couldn't move. But somebody heard God's word. See, the truth is, brothers and sisters, you don't have to be bigger than the problem you're facing. He's already bigger than the problem. I think, Alan, I think I got this from you. Yeah? While you're celebrating the birthdays and family gathered around you. I might be wrong, but many years ago, if I remember correctly, Alan said, have you got a big God and a small problem? Or is it the other way around? You've got a big problem and a small God. Which way is it? Yeah, I, I think that's a very, a very important thing to ask ourselves. Is my problem, is my hesitation bigger than God? Or is it the other way around? Yeah? I think that's a very helpful thing to keep in mind. And we take authority in the name of Jesus. Then we've got to be careful. We've got to be moving in thankfulness. That's an excellent way to move forward. I thank the Lord that he's called, that his voice we have heard. You think about Nehemiah. Some pretty tough times in rebuilding the walls. 
But God's blessing was upon them, enabling them to even get that far. He was a leader with a vision, someone that was going somewhere. And the people were willing to get involved. Actually, Israel was released to action because of Nehemiah's vision. Time and time again, he will use a person in a situation for the extending of his kingdom. But there's something about fixing our sight on him and his word and what he wants. If you like, it's a single-mindedness. We have to beware that we aren't distracted. So when Sambala and Tobias were trying to uh, divert him from the task, he didn't even bother to speak to them. He sent a messenger with this reply, I'm carrying on a great project and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? There's a sense of a vision fixed on the purpose and on the calling of God. Whether we deem the task to be tiny or massive, we cannot afford to come down and engage with the distractors, the Sambala and the Tobias. What's the result? Well, the result is quite interesting. You all remember the story, don't you? He picked up five stones. He turned down the offer or wore the armour. Four of them he didn't need because God gave him what I like to call first stone accuracy. First stone accuracy. With one stone, he carries out what God's called him to do. With one word. We, we can you know, get caught up in the in the literal, but, but it's the first thing, the thing that God gave his word. That can be our first stone. It can be, it can be a, not, um, not, hello, you're a sinner going to hell, but Jesus loves you. It can be, how are you doing today? Never spoken to him before. Just as God leads. First stone accuracy. Brothers and sisters, we've got to believe that we're working with God and he wants us to succeed in his role of extending the kingdom. Why shouldn't it be a simple word here or there? Sometimes it's the word that just shows some interest, maybe the first step, first stone accuracy. I want that. I want that carrying God's word so that it takes us to that accurate place. The Bible says the word of the Lord is sharper than a two-edged sword. Believing for an ability to bring God's word into action and situations which calls him breakthrough. Anybody up for risking it? Yeah? Yeah. I mean, risking it this week? Lord, give me an opportunity. It may be to send a, a letter or, or a text to someone. Maybe you see somebody and you just feel, hmm, I think I need to, to speak to this person. I don't know what to say. Lord, what do I say? You take the first step, and God gives you the next step. It's fun. It's frightening. But it ain't boring. Yeah. I mean, anybody up for a little bit of excitement? Come on. I noticed that was amongst the people that responded, nothing personal here, were the kind of more senior ones amongst us. I mean, perhaps until you get to a certain age, you've got enough excitement in life. Not in the kingdom of God, you ain't. See what he will do. See what he will give. Hmm. 
Believing for an ability to bring something from God. And of course, what did it do? It released the rest of Israel into action. David's faithfulness in killing Goliath. Nehemiah's faith mobilized the demoralized people to do something absolutely incredible. Yeah, there may be times you step into the battlefield alone. But of course, you're never alone. His faithfulness will release others. So here's my question. Before Jamie's going to come and share with us. Here's my question. What is the battle cry we're hearing at the moment? I think I know, but I don't think I'm going to tell you just at this moment. What is the battle cry? Hmm. Turn off the mic. Okay, so the battle cry, what are we talking about? Well, there's a few pieces of the puzzle that I think are beginning to come together, um, but there's still, still more to come. But the sense that we have is that we're on the verge of something. Um, and I'm saying that because for a while we've been reflecting on this uh, picture that, that Mark brought us a little while ago about a tsunami of uh, the, the water being pulled back, exposing the seabed, things that were hidden before being revealed. But it was always on the basis that God was allowing us to deal with some things because the tide was going to be coming back in, the blessing, the power of what he wants to do. And so we already had that on our minds. And then uh, the, the three guys from the AIM team that were with us over the last week um, John, Randy, and Terry, all at different points, said, you're positioned for such a time as this. And God was about, to do something, was about to do something significant, and there was also the warning that we could blow it. So the sense of being on the verge of something we don't want to miss. So I think there's a call for us at the moment to lift our heads and look, what is it that he wants to do? Where is he going to take us? How do we respond to what he's saying to us right now. So um, I've been asking my question, what, what is the great project? So Nehemiah talked about, I'm part of a great project, I can't come down. So what, what is the great project? Well, here's a few pieces of the puzzle. The first thing that I feel that God's talking to us about at the moment is this idea of households together with Christ at the center. So we heard Miro talk about this. I've talked about it takes a, a village to, to raise a parent or a church to raise a parent, which comes from the Rachel Turner book. Um, we're hearing what's going on with the fusion team, this whole idea of families coming together or households coming together to be able to work together and respond to what God's saying. So it started for me um, at the beginning of lockdown, and this little picture um, was was making the rounds. So if you can't read that, it's saying, uh, the devil is saying, with COVID-19, I closed your churches. And God is saying, on the contrary, I just opened one up in every home. Obviously, there's non-Hispanic devils also available. Um, that was just what was in this, uh, this image. Um, that idea that, you know what? Our homes, our households could be places, should be places where we're experiencing God, where we're having church. And so I believe at this time God wants to release parents from any sense of failure and enable them to embrace the God-given calling to lead their families. I believe that God is talking to us about households which are comp comprising individuals or families of different backgrounds and stages of life where new people will be quickly added in and able to belong. I believe God is talking 
about households will be a consistent place where we experience his presence and get equipped to reach out. It's not inward focused. It's being equipped for purpose that God's given us for the whole earth. This is part of the battle cry that God's calling us to respond to at this point in time. Now, what we're going to do over the next few weeks, so I'm going to give you three pieces of, three pieces of puzzle today, and we're going to use the next three Sundays to un- unpack each of those. The next thing, I believe that God's talking to us about ministering the Spirit or ministering in the power of the Spirit. And for that, I believe that God is saying that we are naturally going to be operating in supernatural giftings. And these giftings will be strengthening the church and awakening a hunger for Jesus in those that are lost. And that will be through things like um, miracles and healings, words of knowledge, When we hear some of the stories that Terry King talks about, just having that word of knowledge for the waitress. So, can I pray for you? She said, yes, could you you pray for my parents? Yeah, I'll pray for your parents, but I'm also going to pray for your education because you want to go back to school. "Uh Who told you that? Suddenly, God had her attention. I want to have conversations like that, where someone's interest just just shoots up because... They realize God knows something about them. Who is this God that knows something about them? I believe in a greater ministering of the Spirit, we will have a greater awareness of the presence of God and a willingness to submit to Him. We will know that He's with us wherever we are and that He's working in every human life. And we just want to just see what He's up to. And get to be part of that. There will be a a shortening time between when we hear God tell us to do something. And when we actually say, yes, Lord, I will do it. We'll be able to show, not just describe what God's like. Imagine if you're talking to someone that's never tasted honey before. And you're trying to describe, well, it's a little bit like this. It's a little bit like that. But to actually just be able to say, here's some honey, try it. I think that's what God's going to give us the ability to do. As we, as we talk, as we describe, someone else will begin to experience it. I think that's one of the offers that God's got for us in this battle cry. I believe the work of the Spirit helps us believe and reminds us of the things that, that Jesus has spoken. That we will have a greater ability to believe the promises that he gives us. We can quote so much. Oh yeah, God, God is my provider. But when you think, well, then why am I worried? I wouldn't be living with this level of anxiety if I actually believed that. But I can't make myself believe it. I make a choice to trust him. But I need the spirit that's within inside me to reach out of me and grab hold of what he's promised and pull it in. I can't get that in me other than the work of the spirit. We will have a whole new level of security in who God's called us to be because of the the promise that he has about the ministering of the Spirit. And we'll have a new authority from realizing that the Spirit within is breaking out. We've talked a lot about that, that idea that the Spirit will wear us like a glove. I'm his accessory. He's not mine. He will use me Wherever I'm placed, that I, I'm excited that I take Jesus into my workplace. I take Jesus into my family. I take Jesus into Tesco with me because he's in me and he wants to reach out and touch lives around me. I get a front row seat on what God's about to do through me. And that is a great pleasure and a privilege. Another part of the great project, we will be sharper witnesses for Jesus. A phrase that I'm thinking about at the moment. We will have to explain the source of our power to remain relevant. Over the years, we've learned how to describe God and our walk with God, or, or more importantly, the effects of what we do. Oh, we, we, just, we just love people, we just care for people. But there's going to be a point where we can't just do that because that's not the question that's being asked of us. 
Why? What is your motivation? What is behind this? Why does it happen when you look out for someone that they change where it doesn't in other settings? We think it's going to happen with, with our profile with, within the community. There's going to be points where there's a question. Why do things happen within, when you guys gather around people? It's not because of us. It's because there's a God that loves why do we include? Well, we think inclusion's a good principle and a, a good value. No, we include because Jesus left heaven, became excluded, so that he could die for us, join us to the family of God, so that God could now count us as his own. That's my motivation. I'm going to have to explain that in order to remain relevant. Whew. You know, the biggest obstacle to this is going to be us being willing to put our credibility on the line or our perceived credibility on the line. But you know what? If we don't do it, we become irrelevant. And we're no longer of value. We lose our saltiness. So these are some of the things that I feel that God's talking to us about at the time. We're going to take a bit of time over the next few weeks to unpack what these, what these mean. But you don't have to wait for us to do it on a Sunday. I want you to start thinking about this and talking about this. Because if he's calling us in a battle cry to respond, these are some of the things we can be getting on with to respond to him. Okay, I'll do this one. So, response. How are we going to respond? The battle cry is going out. Are you going to make a choice to respond? What does that mean to respond? Say, yes, God. Now, how the heck am I going to do it? John took us through a whole bunch of must-haves, six must-haves. Truth is, you can't generate those must-haves in your life. You can't try really hard in all those things. We're looking for the Spirit of God to work in us, to produce those things in us. All we've got to be saying, I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I don't need to know how it's going to work out. I will just be obedient. So we're coming to the end now. Keep talking about those things. But maybe you're here today and you've never made this decision to respond to God. And you want to make that choice. There would be people at the front over here that would be willing to and keen to pray with you. We believe that God wants to touch every human heart, that God has a purpose for your life. Maybe you've never known that. We'd like to pray with you about that. Uh, if there's any other things of healing uh, that you'd like people to stand with you in prayer, we'll have the opportunity to do that as well.